2 Timothy chapter 2. And we started, if you remember, in Acts 2.41 in this message and uh, beginning to talk about adding and how the Lord, they that God received his word, were baptized the same day the Lord added unto the church 3,000 souls and then added unto uh, them as many as would be saved at the end of the chapter there. The gospel explosion that began to happen uh, in Acts and after the Lord ascended and the Holy Spirit was sent, and what excites me about that is the fact that we have the same two things that they had. We have the gospel. And the Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the uh, gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Think of that. The Jew first, also the Greek. And then also uh, we have the Holy Spirit of God that was given at Pentecost. He indwells us if you're saved here tonight. And so what an exciting thing. So adding was happening, this explosion, and I'll spare you again the joke about the adders off the ark, all right? But uh, anyway, <laughs> there's a significant change. You come to Acts chapter 6 where now their multiplication takes place, and they're multiplied, and eventually the churches are multiplied. So God's multiplication plan begins to be revealed. And uh, what a message last Wednesday, Brother Kilpatrick challenging again about discipleship and Lord help us that we would each of us pray this year and see it happen, that we would win someone to Christ, see them baptized this year and disciple them. And uh, what a privilege. Wow, what a difference that would make. Second Timothy 2, if you found your place there, put a marker or hold your hand there and turn with me over to Ephesians 4 as we get started. Just trying to remind us, I've already preached two messages. This is part three and Carl already corrected me. He said, well, multiplication, it should be part four. <laughs> anyway, uh, I said, well, then people will be searching for part three all over. So anyway, we won't do that to those online. Ephesians chapter four, uh, we, we see this uh, God's plan here for ministry. It is against our nature. We are in a consuming, uh, uh, a consuming uh, generation. We are consumers and rather than creators or, or entrepreneurs that producers. Well, but the Bible is not, and Christianity is not a, a, a spectator sport, a consumer a situation. Everybody has a part. Everyone has a role. The Bible says we're a body. Here at Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says that in verse 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, who did, the Lord did, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. You ought to write over that verse. This is for that. He gave these gifts to the church. Apostles, we know that's no longer. Uh, prophets in the sense of foretelling God's word, but no longer foretelling. We have the completed canon of scripture. Evangelists, we still see that, of course, in our missionaries. And then some pastors and teachers. He gave these gifts to the church for the perfecting of the saints. That means the maturing of the believer. To be brought to full maturity, to be made full grown, meaning time to grow up, no more a child. And he's writing this to a member of the church at Ephesus. He's not writing this to a pastor. This isn't a pastoral, but this is, he's writing to a church. And he said, this is why God gave you these people in the church, the apostles that have come, like Paul, who is the writer, uh, the pastor's teachers here. He gave them that you would be perfected. Why? For the work of the ministry. That God could do so much more through not through this false doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus said in Revelation, which thing I hate, where you have the clergy and professional Christians, if you will, and the laity, and you just listen to what we tell you, and, and, and you just you know, do what we say, and that's all you do. No, no. Everybody's a participant. Everybody is engaged. Everybody has access. The veil has been rent in twain. You have access to the Lord Jesus directly. For the edifying the body of Christ. So God's plan was that when the pastor teachers, when people got saved, uh, these would help the church, help them to grow up. And as people grow up, they would then engage with the pastor teachers to do the exact same they were already doing, to begin to minister to others, uh, under shepherd, under shepherds. And I often use that term with the deacons, and that's the right term. We, he's the chief shepherd, and pastor God's called us to be under shepherd, but then all of us are called to be under shepherd, under shepherds, where we're helping the other sheep to stay in line, the new sheep that are, tend to stray. I was there, I used to be that. Let me help you, I know how to follow the Lord better now. And we're all leading towards Christ. And, and so we get engaged in that. Again, no period, uh, till... We all come in the unity of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There's the measure of the church. There's the measure of your Christian life and mine, our likeness to Jesus Christ. That, still no period, we henceforth be no more children. We live in a world, as far as church goes, of children in church, baby Christians. If they're born again, a church full of baby Christians. I said this last time, but the reason there's so much fussing and fighting in the nursery is because they're babies. They're children. The reason there's so much fussing and fighting in churches today is because the vast majority are babies. See, they've not grown up in the Lord. No more children. Well, you think Ephesus had that problem? Well, sure. Every, uh, every, uh, <laughs> there's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man, right? We all are, have this human nature, but no more children, time to grow up. No more tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And he continues on, the period is until the end of verse 16. But you think about that. He says he wants you to grow up into him. That he wants to use you. Look at that, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love. Oh, he's talking to the pastor. No, he's talking to you. He's talking to the church. He's talking to all of us that we have the privilege to handle this wonderful words of life and to speak the truth to others and teach the truth to others. Every person. And so that is where we are launching from on this God's multiplication plan. We have to teach what the word of God says here in Ephesians and in these other places. Now back to 2 Timothy. If you'd go there with me, 2 Timothy 2. We must never underestimate the value of one, the value of one soul. Uh, uh, you say, well, I'm not down. Are you down on addition? I'm not down on addition. But our Lord Jesus Christ has planned for that one soul that gets saved much more than just addition. God has planned for him multiplication. God has planned for you multiplication. Look, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, we'll be glad if we got in on God's multiplication plan rather than God's addition. Hey, the addition was where it began, but that wasn't where God ended. He wanted it to begin multiplication as believers were matured. They then entered into the work and now multiplication began. So we need to immediately stop asking, how many decisions, how many additions did you have? Begin asking, how many disciples are you building? How many disciples are you building? This is where the emphasis of Scripture is being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus Christ. Not simply a decision, not simply a prayer prayed, but a true follower, a true disciple of the Lord Jesus. I've said this many times, but you know, when the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven and he said to them, what we have on the wall here, going to all the world and preach the gospel of every creature. When he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I'm with you all the way, even in the world. Amen. The disciples understood that what Jesus had done for them, they were to go and do for someone else. What Jesus had made out of them, they were to go and make out of others. And so this is God's plan for me and God's plan for you. God's plan for every believer. Second Timothy chapter two, we'll pick up in verse one. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wore than tangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husband that laboreth must be first partake of the fruits. Consider what I say. And I read this far for this emphasis, verse 7. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. I've written beside that verse in my Bible. We need Jesus. The Lord give thee understanding in all things. If we're going to make our life count, I need the Lord's help to help me understand what is important in this life. So short. I want to bring this third part of this, the last part of this message on God's multiplication plan. Let's pray. Lord, help us, please, as we look down your word. Would you help us to put to practice? We look at these seven portraits, this beautiful picture of the profile of the disciple. What we're to be. And now, Lord, would you help us to act and what we're to do as we'd see that tonight. Oh, move in our hearts, Lord. Stir us about your vision, your plan for our lives. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Number one, we looked at already the profile of a multiplying disciple. What does a multiplying disciple look like? And we talked about this is what I'm to be. Remember, what we do grows out of what we 
are. And so what I'm to be, what, I'm, what am I to look like? What does a disciple look like? And we gave these seven portraits. We already read about a couple of them just there. Uh, the son in verse one. And then we talked about the soldier as we get to verse three. And, and there's seven pictures, a son, a soldier, an athlete, a husband, a workman, a, a, a vessel, a servant, all in, in 2 Timothy chapter two. These seven pictures of a disciple kind of all supply, uh, help to form this portrait of what we're to be as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so tonight I want to look at the point number two, not just the profile of a multiplying disciple, but number two, the procedure for a multiplying disciple. This is what I'm to do. So I've seen the picture of what I'm to be. Now, what am I to do as a multiplying disciple? How can I multiply as God intends that I'm to do that? Well, I want to really zero in on verse two. The Bible says, and the things that thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou, notice me, thou, to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. There's four generations of disciples in this verse. You have Paul, the apostle, and then you have Timothy, the thou, then you have the faithful men, that's plural, and then you have others also. So four generations that are laid out here, uh, right here. The diagram of this would look like a widening funnel. In fact, let me just illustrate it for you for a minute. Brother Patrick, you mind help me? You, I'll let you be Paul. And so you be here. Brother Gerald, you be Timothy. And, uh, and so just stand here yeah, facing that way. Good. Yeah. And then you're just right here. Good. So we got Paul, then we got Timothy. Now we need some faithful men. And so we, it'd be ladies too. Why don't you both, would you mind coming? And then Chris and uh, um, Jasmine. Let's say Laura. It's not Laura. All right. So just keep the line going, but now it's, the funnel's widening out. So yeah, we'll make two groups here. Good. All right, so here's the faithful men and women, and God's using just the generic term of we're, we're mankind, okay? In mankind, there's male and female, so don't get upset. It's, we're talking in generic, obviously, men and women both. Uh, then uh, let me have, uh, oh, we'll get everyone up. Sure, Stavros and, uh, and Tina and Lynn, come on. And these are the others also. Come on, Brother Myers. And, and uh, so now let's see if we can get four across here. All right, I know it's a little tight. But you all are married, so that's okay. And then Lynn, Lynn and Brother Myers, they like to be close to each other anyway. So good. Get four across there. Can you do it? Good. All right. So here's the idea. The idea is that Paul teach Timothy. Timothy teaches these faithful men. Then the faithful men are now teaching others also. And, and this idea of this widening funnel that takes up more and more territory. Are you guys done? Just kidding. I knew I picked the wrong people just then. I maybe should have them face me. Yeah, turn around and face me now. <laughs> there we go. That's a lot worse, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, uh, so the idea is this. There, and there's two crucial things you talk about this relationship. Now, you have to get this. Some people want to think, well, now this is just a big mass of people and, and individuals are important. When you talk about multiplying, the individual is exponentially more important. You see, God's, this is, you have Paul and Timothy, but Paul didn't just have Timothy. Look, over here's Titus. Over here's Epaphras. Over here's Tychicus. Hey, there were, this is just one of the spokes coming off of Paul. They were going all directions. See, and, it, and it's infinite. It goes on and on and on. And because of that, the individual becomes infinitely more important. By the way, Scotty's a Paul. Timothy's a Paul to some. So Timothy doesn't just have, off of him is coming this same thing too. But so it is with Chris. Off of Chris Mills is coming this same thing off of him. And so it's just, it's just this widening thing ongoing. Actually, because of this, the individual is infinitely more important. So let's say this spoke gets knocked out. Chris doesn't continue. So Chris, you and Jasmine go sit down. Brother Myers and Lynn, you guys sit down. Our troublemakers, y'all go sit down. So immediately... <laughs> Immediately, if Brother Mills, if Jasmine, if they don't continue, look, half of it is just wiped out. So one person is exponentially more important. The individual is so important. Now, everyone's not going to continue, but you see the multiplication, how quickly it grows. It's just like this. You think, well, what do you, you pick up an acorn. Someone says, what is this? Well, it's an acorn. Someone with a little vision says, it's a buckeye, but it's okay. Uh, uh, someone says, uh, no, that's, that's, a, that's an oak tree. Okay. But someone with a little further vision says, no, that's a whole forest. 
See, that's seeing the potential. So one person is an infinite amount. I mean, just a, a thing. That's why Paul hasn't been to the Bema seat yet, because his reward's not in yet. Now, if you die or others that have already died, they've not been to the Bema seat. They've not got the award yet because their works do follow them. They're still coming. All right, y'all be seated. Thanks so much. And so I want you to see the visual of what God wants to do, not through the preacher, but through your life. And that's the exciting thing about serving the Lord. There's all different roles, but every person has the same opportunity, the same privilege of one discipling one. You may not get up and preach, and preach a, a Pentecost message, but Pentecost is not what God had done. It was the one-on-one -on -one discipling and the multiplication. That's what God had done. How many, how many members in the church at Ephesus? How many members of the church of Philippi? The Bible never gives any indication of how big it was. Because that wasn't the measure. The measure was that they were like Jesus Christ and multiplying. The numbers were going to get big because they were doing God's work. So I want you to get that in your mind as we go. Not only that, two crucial things about disciple making, not just the individual, but also the importance of influence. I meant to say, say this while they were still up here. But when I knocked Chris Mills out and that whole branch got lost, it, it underscores influence. Because if one person, the devil can get you discouraged. The devil can get you uh, to backslide. The devil can get you to quit and just sit down and be done. I'm not going to do that anymore. It's too much work. It takes too much time. And it does take time. That's why I call the son. It's like raising a child. But boy, what a privilege but also what a responsibility and what loss if you don't handle that influence properly. Paul, as he went into cities, had an opportunity to use his influence and he did. I believe he was kind. I believe he spoke the truth in love as he wrote to Ephesus that they were to do. Uh, he was hospitable. He was persuasive. I believe he was an attractive. I believe he adorned uh, the, 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 the Lord Jesus Christ well and made it very attractive becoming. He was an ambassador for Christ. Then you have to have a Timothy. Timothy was available. Uh, Timothy was willing. Timothy uh, was teachable. Timothy was faithful. He was a disciple. So how does discipleship, how does this process really work? How do I reach a disciple? How did Paul get it across to Timothy? Uh, you used this illustration at the end of last a message about the Black Plague. Uh, more recently, we could talk about COVID, right? Uh, how, did, how does it, it must fully get in, I must fully get infected. It must become a part of me so I become then contagious and carry on this contagion. How did Paul's contagion spread to him so that Timothy himself became contagious with it? Well, I'll be the secrets right there in verse 2. And the things that thou hast, what's the next word? Heard. The things that thou hast heard of me. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In the process of disciple making, what does hearing entail? Well, look at chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, verse 10 and 11. Paul says here as he's writing to Timothy, but thou hast fully known, you ought to mark those two words, fully known my doctrine, what I teach and believe, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my charity, my patience. Boy, Talk about a transmission, a, a transparency, a, a transformation that w this, this was happening in Timothy's life as Paul let him see all these things. His lifestyle, his purpose, his faith, his faithfulness, his long suffering, his ability to suffer long, charity, patience, persecutions. Paul didn't hide anything. He saw the severity of the persecutions that, Timothy, that, that Paul uh, had to deal with, the afflictions which came to him at Antioch and, and, and uh, Iconium at Lystra where he was stoned and left for dead, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. He also wanted to point out, just so you know, though, the Lord was with me all the time. And even when I dealt with those difficult days, like Elizabeth Elliot wrote in our bulletin there, the Lord was helping me to know him in a greater way. Wow, pretty powerful stuff. This is the natural outcome of what has been called the with him or the with me principle of discipleship. You say, where did that come from? Well, the Lord Jesus. Hold your place. We're going to come back. This is the only other place we're going to turn. Look at Mark 3. Mark chapter 3. Discipleship is not a gospel like Baptist church idea. It's not my idea. It's the Lord Jesus' idea. This is his plan. This is his way. When Jesus left this earth, you remember, 
He didn't say, all right, figure it out from here. He said, as the Father sent me, even so send I you. With the same authority to do the same work. Follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. And he commanded them that they would go and see people saved, baptize and teach them all things. Make a disciple. Mark 3 verse 14, notice about Jesus. The Bible says, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him. And that he might send them forth to preach. With him. With him. See, it's, it's a time life transfer. The first call was to be with Jesus. Not to go out and preach for the disciples. Not to go out and... No, no. First they had to be made something. They had to spend time with Jesus and he was going to make them into something. He was going to transfer. He was going to teach. He was going to commit. See, being a disciple, making disciples are lifestyles that are caught more than they're taught. This is something that shows up in life as people see. You know what? Can you imagine going on a missions trip with the Apostle Paul? Can you imagine traveling on one of his missionary journeys with him? I mean, would it be possible to go on one of those missionary journeys with Paul and watch him and see him and see God work and not be changed, not be affected? Not recognize, not, the, and the Spirit of God not say to you, this is what I've called every Christian to do. Wow, can you imagine what a, what a life-changing event that, well, Timothy now is equipped, he's trained. Well, once that happens, what does he do? Well, back in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, the things that thou hast, thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to, te able to teach others also. So there's two words here that call for special attention in verse 2, back in 2 Timothy now. Faithful and commit. He says, the things that thou hast heard of me, now he's got it, now it's been placed in him, the same, you got to mark those two words, the same commit to faithful men. Boy, we must pray for faithful men and women. And by the way, Timothy didn't change it. The same, <laughs> the same, the same. He didn't change the plan. The same. Faithful has the idea of staying the same, teaching the word of God. What does faithful men and women look like? We ought to show what a faithful person looks like. We ought to teach them to be faithful, not by our words, but by our life. That they see that we're faithful, we're committed, and we must pray, God, give us faithful men and faithful women that I can invest in. See, when you have faithful men and women, it guarantees that the second and third generation will go on. That this multiplication will continue. We, we have second and third generation leadership there. That word commit, you ought to notice, it's a banker's term. It means to deposit into. The things that thou hast heard of me among uh, many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. To deposit into. Uh, to invest into. Uh, when you deposit into a savings account, you expect a dividend. You expect a return on your investment. That's the idea. So it is with a disciple. Uh, you're not merely disinfecting a sinner. You're making a quantitative investment in a disciple uh, uh, that will accrue interest indefinitely into eternity. You're investing in eternity. So here comes the question. The crucial question, the sobering question is your present life, your Christian life, is it more of an expenditure or an investment? Are you spending it or are you investing it? Now think carefully about that. See, if you're, if you're spending it, then the expenditure is final. If, if you're investing it, it will accrue dividends all the way until God calls time. When... Time shall be no more and the church is raptured out, even past your life. Even some of our Christian activities, what we would call Christian activities, if we're not careful, would fall under the category of expenditure. Are we investing in eternity through discipling, through this life transfer, this committing into faithful men? See, Timothy was to take the total investment of Christ's life. Christ had invested into the Apostle Paul. He called himself, uh, we don't know all what happened in Arabia for that time that he was there at God, uh, evidently taught him things. And he called himself an apostle born out of due time. And, and so the Lord Jesus discipled the Apostle Paul. Certainly Barnabas had a part. But this Christ's life that was transferred into Paul now has been transferred into Timothy. 
And Timothy is responsible to transfer it to faithful men. Well, how do I know when that's done? When the faithful men are able to teach others also. So when they are teaching others also, the same things that Paul committed to you, Timothy, that you've committed to these faithful men, when they are teaching others also, then you've transferred fully what God intended. And that's God's plan for me. That's God's plan for all of us. This is the Lord's multiplication plan. We see it right here, so simple in the scriptures. This is how, there's several places in the New Testament, I won't take time to show you where they reached the whole world, where the whole world, they said, heard the gospel. Think about that. We couldn't say that in this day with internet, with planes, <laughs> with the television technology, all of that. We couldn't say that, but they could. It's in the Holy Writ that the whole world heard the gospel in their day. How? Not through adding, through multiplication. So the process should be constantly enlarging to an expanding funnel that encompasses more and more territory and includes more and more people. I'm going to end with this just as we conclude tonight in illustration. If you imagine, just as a hypothetical illustration, an evangelist like Brother Garraway that was here, Caleb Garraway, or Brother Scott Pauley uh, that's been here before. If they, uh, they preach all over and you, you start reading about what they're doing, there, many times in a week they're preaching five or six days of those week, weeks and special meetings and different things. If you imagine that if we could freeze time and Brother Pauley or Brother Garraway was able to lead a thousand people to Christ a day through their preaching services. It'd be exciting. A thousand people. It would take over 15,000 years if we could freeze time uh, as, far as, as far as population would go. It would take over 15,000 years if population stays the same for every person to get saved. At a thousand a day. If you had Pentecost every day, it would take over 5,000 years. You don't have 5,000 years. People are going to die and live. You can't freeze population. You can't keep people up. But it's amazing as you begin to do the numbers, and many of you have heard this before. This is nothing new with me. But if one disciple, just this year, if one person would disciple one person and take a whole year to do it, that's it. One person, a whole year. And life transfer, fully known, my ministry, fully, fully deposit into what, what the Lord Jesus put into Paul and the other apostles and has come down through other people now to me to, and to you. Then those two, the next year, would get one more. And those two are four. And those four would get one more the next year and those four eight. And it, in 23 years, by the way, they would catch up and pass the evangelist who had a thousand a day. But in 35, just a little over 35 years, the whole world would be discipled. Now, again, that's everything working perfectly, and that's a hypothetical situation. But you see, it's doable, just like COVID spread, how quick. It's doable in our generation, in our lifetime. That's God's plan for every generation. That we would serve our generation as David did, and then fall on sleep. Now, the ones that Pentecost reached, the ones that the apostle, or Scott Pauley, if in this illustration, would reach would just simply be converts. Hey, I'm grateful for converts. I'm for converts. But the ones that we were a part of in the one-on-one -on -one for a year would not simply just be a convert. They would be a disciple. If you had to choose, what do you want, a convert or a disciple? Well, both of those things we should, be, we should be engaged in. Jesus was engaged in winning people to Christ, and he was also engaged in discipling the 12, wasn't he? And so both must be done. You have no one left to disciple, like Brother Kilpatrick was preaching last Wednesday, if we didn't continue to win people to Christ. That has to happen. But Jesus did not, the Great Commission is not fulfilled what Jesus said if we simply have a convert. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Look, if people go to a big crusade and they get saved, they're not baptized. Some church has got to follow up with them and get them in the church, get them baptized, become a member of the church, then someone's going to invest in them. There has to be that life transfer to, to form a disciple. So no one that goes to a crusade or goes to some big uh, a revival service and gets saved and becomes a convert ever disciples anybody from that single experience. They have to first be disciples. Someone, somewhere is going to have to take them under their wing and make it happen. 
And that's what God intends for me and you to do. And many of you are doing that. The back of our bulletin is covered with people that are doing that, involved in it. But this is, again, I just want to encourage you, especially with the new folks that have come in to our church, to recognize this is not just the gospel light way. This isn't just something that the Pastor Bowman way. This is the Lord Jesus Christ way. And seen throughout the New Testament, it is the Lord's way, the Bible way. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things that thou hast heard of me. Among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. So here's some questions. Friend, do you have the vision of world impact by disciple making? That was Jesus' vision. Do you have that vision? That God wants me, my life, not, not, not our church, your life, my life, to have a world impact. Are you qualitatively investing Jesus' lifestyle his vision, his commitment in the lives of individuals so that they have a similar vision and commitment and can impart them to others. See, one author wrote about this idea. Every Christian has the potential for an eternal impact in countless lives. Every Christian has the potential for an eternal impact in countless lives. But we've got to answer some serious questions then about what we're giving ourselves to. Maybe even embarrassing questions. Is our goal the same one that Jesus lived for? As a Christian, is our goal the same one that Jesus lived for? Pleasing the Father, about my Father's business, seeking to save and disciple the save, then in turn giving to us this great commission that we are to go do the very same thing. Like I said, the disciples, the apostles did not misunderstand. They knew when Jesus ascended to heaven saying, go ye therefore and teach all nations. And they watched him go up to heaven. They knew they were to go and do what Jesus did for them for someone else. And it would go on all the way into eternity. And they did, by the way. And the apostle Paul did and, and give, give us these things in the New Testament. We see this is the New Testament way. In short, a God-sized vision, the whole wide world, the ends of the earth. Interesting, God says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I'm with you. It doesn't say ye. Lo, I'm with you always, even in the end of the earth. You. God wants you and your life to impact all the way to the end of the earth, all the way to the end of the age, either way you want to talk about that. Same, same principle. So are we investing time? Quality time, but quality time. 2 Timothy 3, 10 11. Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life. Systematically, are we doing this? Investing systematically in others' lives, this discipling. Are we imparting Christ's vision? The vision we find in verse 2, the Apostle Paul shared, the same vision we see in Matthew 28, 18 through 20 there, so that our disciples are consumed with this discipling multiplication plan and thus will communicate it to others. Are they fully infected with the contagion of it? See, to be contagious for others. Many generations of Christians depend on you and I and our obedience to the Lord Jesus, our example and his word. Yeah, I can't help but think about my dad. My dad uh, went to, was, grew up Methodist, and his Sunday school teacher actually brought him in. This up in Michigan. I brought in a scale, said, if your good works that way, you're bad, you'll make it into heaven. Well, he, was a, he wanted to go to heaven, and he was an acolyte, lit the candles at the church. and He was 13, I believe it was, and church camp, got the word about going to church camp, and uh, at 13, he heard that uh, there would be a lot of pretty girls at church camp. So he was interested in that sort of thing. And so he went, and the man that got up and preached that week preached on hell. He'd never heard preaching on hell. Began to preach on, you had to make a decision to be saved. Nothing about good works and bad works, but that you had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, and he got saved. I don't even know the name of that man. Not only that, he did some, some sort of discipling even through that week and, and, and pressing on them the... the the responsibility not just to be saved, but to serve the Lord with your life. And in that same week he got saved, he surrendered to preach the gospel. Now think about that. Coming from a Methodist background, his, his mom was saved, but his dad was there in a Methodist church. Goes to the week of camp, gets saved, and also surrenders to preach the gospel. Well, we fast forward 
through all that, and I'm sure there's plenty of people, others that discipled him and things, but just the impact of that, and again, I don't even know the name of that preacher, that camp. I don't even know if my dad knows the name, but the impact that's still going on, other people that invested him in Canada and the, the, the ministry there for 25 years, in my life and everything out of my life, he, he's upstream from me, and so he has part of that fanning out, and others that I've impacted, that all is a part. Now think about that. Think about the just ever widening funnel of, of, of impact from one life. If you ever were around Dr. Lee Robertson, I heard him preach. It's hard to hear him without him talking about Daisy Hawes. Daisy Hawes, his Sunday school teacher, who gave the gospel when he got saved. Well, I, I, all over the country, and all, during that generation, uh, talking about Daisy Hawes. Uh, he, people didn't know who she was, but everyone knew who Dr. Lee Robertson was, and she had a part in everything he did as a, a Sunday school teacher of junior boys. I mean, think about that. The impact God wants, not just for your church as a whole, not just for your pastor or some, who you might think, uh, some evangelist or somebody, but for you and for me, one-on-one, -on -one, and the, just a lifetime multiplication. Wow. Some of you have already seen it. We, we had in our discipleship meeting just a little bit of that, seeing that. It's, it's exciting already. I'm excited to see the years to come, what God's going to do. This influence, the ripples from life extending in our lives. God's multiplication plan. Let's bow and pray.